So my name is Ole Nydal. I'm from Denmark. I'm a Lama. I teach Tibetan Buddhism. And I'm from a lineage called Kamakachi, which is known as the yogi lineage of Tibetan Buddhism. The highest realization we can talk about in Buddhism, where subject, object, and action become one, where one is spontaneously and intuitively and effortlessly one with all things at all times and places, is called Mahamudra. And um, to get an idea of the depth and the meaning of these teachings and the thankfulness one should also feel from being connected with them, one can say that if one mainly practices through avoiding harm, which would be like a basic Theravada approach, then, you know, even drinking from the stream where a bad man has drunk will bring some kind of negative influence. If one practices on the level of inner life, of compassion and wisdom, one can actually become enlightened in three countless kalpas, as it's called, which is also quite a lot. Even though one involves things like compassion and wisdom and so on, and deep teaching about the emptiness of all things, then still, you know, one is not totally involved. The place one becomes totally involved is where the view is introduced, the view of the way things are, the view of the the Buddha nature of all beings, of the pure essence of whatever is going on. Where this is involved, where this is brought in, then we can talk about quick enlightenment. Actually, the Buddha, practical as he was, taught different kinds of students. Those who wanted to get rid of their own problems, he talked basically about cause and effect. Those who wanted to benefit others, he taught about compassion and wisdom. But those who had developed so much radiance, so much power, quality in their minds, that they no longer saw the Buddha as a god or a person outside, but as a mirror to their own face, as something showing them the nature of that which was aware those people who could react with direct devotion because they found something that they knew intensely and very, very deeply, which they recognized as their own essence. To those people, he then taught the way of identification, which today comes to us in two different ways. It comes in the one way to us, you know, through the thing we call, uh, through that which we call the formed approach, as the different uh, Buddhas that one way meditate on, where actually, you know, if one is mainly an anger type, one will meditate on the father tantras. If one is a desire type, one will meditate on the mother tantras. And if one is a confusion type, one will meditate on the non-dual tantras. But not only on the level of meditating on Buddha forms and using their vibration, their mantra to create an energy bridge between inside and out, and then dissolving in light and mixing it into oneself, but also on the level of formless awareness of mind's power, mind's ability and experience of its own nature. Here also we can talk about very different, very special teachings which are the ones that in our school are called Mahamudra. Actually, there are different aspects. There are different uh, ways that one can work with it. Uh, Even on the highest levels, where one is really convinced that the Buddha is not something else or somewhere else, but that he is that which looks through our eyes and listens through our ears right now, even on the highest levels of awareness, we will still have different tendencies. Somebody will maybe be a desire type. And for that person who mainly has desire, it will be the richness, the free play of the mind, the many pictures and the experience, you know, which is useful. It will be like a person who learns best by swimming in the water. And if one is an anger type, there's more pride, more distance and stuff like that, good, one will follow the aspect called Mahaati or Dzogchen, which is actually in its true nature the same. 
there. It's not so much the richness of mind, you know, that interest is more the self-liberating quality. Wow, I got rid of it all again, free space and stuff like that. That's more for anger types. They will feel concentrated and open to that. And these two teachings, the Mahamudra and the Mahaachi, the Chakchen and the Dzogchen, actually involve all the qualities we have inside. They're like driving a very fast motorcycle down a curvy road. They're like falling deeply in love. They're something totally involving. Then there's also for the confusion types, there's the Umachempo, which it's called, you know, which, or the Madhyamaka, which is mainly head work, and gradually what was accepted in the head will begin to fall down into the heart and, the, and wherever else one experiences. So this is a much longer way. It takes a much longer time to get there like that. Actually, it's quite interesting that different Buddhist schools, Tibetan Buddhist schools, have become have followed different ones of these ways. For instance, our Kachi school follows uh, Mahamudra. We are, if you see the groups, they are always close together, touching each other. So there's a close connection, so we follow the Mahamudra. The Nyingma Pais, which have apparently less desire but more pride and anger, they do the Mahaati or the Dzogchen. And the Gelukpas, you know, which are more a studying way and so on, go the longer way of intellectual analysis and so on. So one can actually see that these different types of people in different Buddhist schools are inspired by different ones of these directions. In the Mahamudra, it is a question of experiencing space as bliss, unbroken, unstopping is constantly radiating into the world, is feeling as if you had two fingers in the plug and pulling all the energy of Sydney or San Francisco or Copenhagen or Berlin or whatever through your bones at that very moment. This is the essence of that, experiencing everything as totally fresh, new, playful, radiant, meaningful in every second, as every atom vibrating with joy kept together by love, you know, everything on the highest level of meaning and joy. This is what the Mahamudra is supposed to be. It's a state where we are totally fearless because we know that that which is looking through our eyes and listening through our ears is space, that it's not a thing, that it hasn't been born, that it cannot die, that nobody put it together, it cannot fall apart, but that this space in its true nature is indestructible and that one can really trust it. Then, at the same time also, it's not just a dead space or a black hole or something like that, but one notices the richness, the possibilities, all the things that the mind can do, the freshness, uh, many different qualities which appear, and they are manifested as joy. Actually, at this level, old age, sickness and death is just as interesting as youth, joy and love. It's just either form appears out of space or returns to space, but in both cases, it shows the quality of what space is and has. And finally, then, one also becomes kind. And one becomes kind because one cannot separate one's own happiness from that of others. But of course, today, the way the world is, one has to be kind and smart, not kind and stupid. One has to be kind and do things that are useful in a hundred years, and not just do things that are useful in a few years. And therefore today, you know, right, quite practically, the important thing for us all to do is to lower the population in the ghettos and the poor parts of the world. This is a real expression of kindness in the world today. It is the point which is going to mean if the world will be worth living in, in future lives, you know, or not. So kindness must not be stupid. Kindness must really be connected with, and it's very important, it must be connected with wisdom. But these three qualities, this fearlessness, joy, and active compassion, this is actually what the Mahamudra is all about and what we should try to reach. So that was a little bit about, you know, the, the goal Mahamudra, the ultimate Mahamudra, the state of full functioning where one acts without separation between subject, object, and action. Now we come to the way. Of course, the way starts with getting one's values and one's priorities right. It really starts by understanding that this life is, offers a rare and special opportunity for development, understanding about impermanence, recognizing that we create our own lives through cause and effect, 
and then understanding that all things will die and disappear and fall away again and that there's no way we can keep them and for therefore we should try to look for lasting and real values. And once we get to that, you know, we take what's called refuge. And refuge means really opening up, you know, on the level of body, speech and mind to perfection, not as an outer God or an outer being or something else, but as a full realization of our own mind. And after this opening up process, you know, we actually go into a way which is quite simple to explain, but many-sided in its number of methods. It's called in Tibetan, Sunam Ditso, Yeshe Ditso. It's the building up of good actions and the building up of wisdom. The building up of good actions is basically trying in all things in life to do, think and say that which benefits beings most, which creates the most use and happiness and so on for all beings. And on the level of insight, it's to develop the understanding that things are not personal, that we are not the target, but that cause and effect works and that we ourselves are creating our lives all the time that the world is like a great collective dream appearing out of everybody's karma, and that inside this collective dream, everybody has like their own private dreams. Then, from a certain time, meditation becomes an ever deeper experience. More and more one's mind develops a quality to rest in itself, experience itself, and we go through these different stages, which are called Chirim or Zogrim, when you meditate on Buddha forms, which is called Shamatha Vipassana, or, or Shine Laktong, when you, uh, when you look at the general principle of calming and holding the mind and developing wisdom and so on. And here, gradually, we go into ever deeper states where the mirror becomes more and more aware of itself through and behind the pictures, where the ocean is more and more felt through the waves coming and going there, where that which knows and understands and experiences more and more becomes unbroken and unstopping. And here, um, through this building up of good actions, removing negative dreams, opening more and more good dreams, we more and more get into states where this experience is very close or where, it's actually, where it actually happens to us. We go to states of mind where, you know, where first we can rest naturally in what's there. I mean, we are basically so rich inside, we don't need to go anywhere. There's nowhere we have to go. There's nothing we have to do in any way. It's like having a house full of food and a very lovely boy or girlfriend, you know. Why should you go out? You are so rich in yourself. You have everything in yourself. Everything fits. You need nothing from anywhere. Then there is the next level, which is that where one stops being artificial, where one really discovers that what's actually happening right now is more fantastic and meaningful than anything one can even dream about, yeah, anything one could even, even begin to fabricate in one's mind, right? That every atom is vibrating with joy, kept together by love, that everything is meaningful the way it is that we don't need to die to go to a pure land, and we don't need to go anywhere else to meet Buddhas. We just need to polish our eyes, and then we'll see they're all Buddhas, and everything is a pure land. I mean, everything is already there. And then from that level, you know, one goes into the level of, you know, of the highest level after the level of one taste, you know, which was the third level where the experience is always there and not lost again. One goes into the highest level, which is that of just spontaneously doing what's in front of one's nose, never, you know, without any kind of feeling of separation between subject, object, and action, and for the benefit of all. And here, for this Mahamudra, which is clearly the dream of everybody, whoever even got close to the state will not wish anything else. There is nothing better, finer, more meaningful. It is the ultimate. It's the best of all. Whoever wants to come to this state, whoever even wants to get close to that state, you know, should have a real transmission from somebody who has it. I remember the Kamapa, the Kamapa in his 16th incarnation, he gave the transmission to Hannah and myself three times. And actually when he gave that, you know, 
one of the times was in Copenhagen and it was just we just had to completely focus our mind with his while he held a hundred kroner Danish note between his fingers and then we had to catch it that means we had to know when he was going to let it go and this moment we were standing there it was already we were we were standing there you know and being one with his mind in that moment and you try that it is difficult it is really difficult doing that is not easy at all you know at that moment you know, you know and i think we managed quite well <laughs> another time he called us up in sikkim a third time i've been sitting in the top of a tree in an enormous storm you know and all the trees fell right and left you know and apparently my tree stayed you know but anyway it was really it was wild the branches flew in all directions i was in france then afterwards he also took us in so every one of these times what was special about the mahamudra it was it was here and now and it was a sharing a mind and somehow you came out and you had no concepts you were just like open and things were a little bit more shiny and they belonged more together and it was it was like there was another dimension there was a little bit of air under the feet the feeling was was really different and this then starts working and working and working and today you know i mean it's it's a lasting experience it's something you never lose you don't lose it when you are awake you don't lose it when you dream it's always there the awareness is there without stop and here then and this is what our lineage the kamakachi lineage are really aiming to give to the world our new centers lay centers yogi centers functioning in the world for the people of today this is the goal we wish to share with you can everybody achieve the mahamudra that's a good question actually by the teaching of the buddha everybody's true essence is the mahamudra mind is clear light mind is not a thing it's open like space it's radiantly clear it has no ending or stop or limit to it anywhere and whenever mind recognizes its own nature that is mahamudra that is buddhahood that is the whole goal the amazing thing is that we've been here since beginningless time every one of us you know and we know so many things about the outer world the way the color the smell the size of everything and if anybody asks us who is seeing the outer world right who is experiencing who everybody is happening to then they just look around for the person with the thickest reading glasses and hope that they'll answer because they think they're smarter than they are but actually nobody really knows i mean it's amazing that's why we compare the mind to an eye that can see everything but cannot see itself the image that i think is very good to use in that connection is the ring and the hook the ring is our openness our potential buddha nature and the hook is like the blessing of somebody who has a realization and we do need both i know that in study lineages they talk as if it's enough you just learn the things and understand the things but that will take as they say three countless universes right kalpas you know it takes a long time but if you can do on the one side we do our best we work we train we do whatever we can and then somebody hands down the experience of the buddha those unbroken lineages of transmission where the karma path that we have here is the main holder of them all if somebody who holds his transmission and his experience then passes on the mahamudra to us then actually this realization can come very quickly we have cases of people who recognize the nature of their mind in a single lifetime having started with all kinds of heavy things in the in their youth you know they actually manage so what's the end of their life to totally transform everything so on the one side we all have the buddha nature on the other side you know then um there has to be that blessing and what i think you know is that actually the western background that we all have the transparency of our western background the start the things we learn the critical abilities and all the other qualities that we have that they are the finest basis for mahamudra ever what i often think when i look at people like all of you is that the buddha would have been honored and glad to teach you i mean i am of course not knowing very much i'm glad and honored right but even the buddha would have been happy to have followers listeners you know students you know like the people of the modern western societies 
with their freedom, with their independence, with their education, with their idealism and with their honesty. I really think so. I don't think there have ever been finer students of the highest teachings in the world than the people in the Western cultures today who enter Buddhism. I think we are going to have a ball around the world. We are going to have levels of consciousness happening. We are going to have joys and powers and growth, you know, like nobody can even imagine today. That's what I think. That's really what I think. So, wish us good luck or join. <laughs> or join. <laughs>